Welcome to the fourth season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you are a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Twenty miles east of Los Angeles is Puente Hills. It was in the parking lot at the Puente Hills Mall where Doc Brown introduced the DeLorean time machine in the movie Back to the Future. Six years later, that same mall took center stage in a crime spree that California has never forgotten. Growing up in the early 70s, John Lewis bounced between his older brother and sister's homes. By age 10, he was breaking the law, and while still a juvenile, spent time at the California Youth Authority. At 19, John was arrested for possessing a sawed-off shotgun and returned to the California Youth Authority, where he remained until June 1991. Six days after his release, he began a crime spree that injured three and ended in five murders. On July 5th, John was riding in his girlfriend, Eileen Huber's car. Following them in another vehicle was his brother-in-law and a friend. They purposely bumped into a red truck. The driver pulled over, and Eileen pulled over behind him. John got out and strode up to Jose Avina in the driver's seat. Court records indicate that John pulled out a 12-gauge sawed-off shotgun and demanded the keys. Then aimed the gun at his head and pulled the trigger. Jose died at 22. The truck rolled on to a nearby lawn. John reached in and pulled Jose out, got behind the wheel, and drove to a park. There, they yanked the stereo out. Then John drove the truck to Pomona and deserted it. A month later, on August 3rd, Augustine Ramirez was working at the restaurant he owned with his wife, Linda. At midnight, after a long day, they were ready to head home. They had driven to work separately, so Augustine walked Linda to her car. She put the key in the ignition, and the engine roared to life. Augustine then turned and headed towards his car. But before he could get more than a few feet, a vehicle pulled up and blocked him. Linda saw John point an 18-inch shotgun at Augustine. She tried to get her door open, but before she could, John pulled the trigger. Hitting Augustine once. He was rushed to the hospital, but later died of his wounds. Augustine was 55. Eugene Valdez worked as a salesman at a car dealership. Just after 9 p.m. on August 9th, as the sun was setting over the Pacific Ocean, he left work driving his brown Oldsmobile Cutlass. 30 minutes into his 70-mile drive home, he was tired and decided to pull over. He turned off the engine, locked the doors, and fell asleep. John and his friend Vincent Hubbard were driving when they spotted the Olds and stopped. 55-year-old Eugene woke up to a sawed-off shotgun banging on his car and a voice yelling at him to open the door. They forced him to lay face down in the back seat. Vincent sat on his legs while John slipped behind the wheel, pausing to turn on the radio. While John drove, he and Vincent began arguing on which direction they should go. At the same time, Vincent was threatening to kill Eugene, hitting him with his fist and demanding his wallet and watch. John responded, 
Don't do it. We can use the car. A half hour later, Eugene could feel the car climbing up a hill as his heart pounded and his mind raced, wondering what was going to happen next. John pulled into a turnout and ordered him out. John and Vincent nudged him toward the edge of a cliff. Eugene glanced down quickly and noticed the drop-off was steep. Vincent held the gun. As they moved closer to the edge, he heard one of them say, You shoot him. That was all Eugene needed to hear. He sprung into action and threw himself over the cliff just as he heard a clicking sound. Eugene tumbled head over heels for 150 feet. Once his body stopped, he stayed put and listened. Once he was sure they'd left, he climbed up and flagged down a motorist. John stripped Eugene's car, removing the front fenders, bumper, grill, hood, battery, and tires, then installed it on his own car, which was the same make, model, and color. John decided they needed more weapons to continue their crime spree, and knew Eileen's father had a number of guns. John waited for Eileen, her brother and father, to leave their home. He broke in and stole three handguns, five rifles, and ammunition. The next day, John and Vincent staked out a bank. There, they watched a young couple in the mid-20s, Juan Rios and his fiancée, Sonia Aguirre, pull up to the drive through ATM. Juan leaned out the driver's window and started to put his bank card in the machine when John and Vincent surrounded their car, each holding a gun. One of them demanded Juan withdraw the maximum amount his card would allow and threatened to shoot him, while the other one went to the passenger window and pointed his gun at Sonia and demanded she hand over her engagement ring. The ATM was malfunctioning, and Juan couldn't withdraw any money. John got impatient and opened the back door and sat behind Juan, while Vincent slid in behind Sonia. John pushed the gun into the back of Juan's head and ordered him to drive to the front of the bank and use the walk-up ATM. Juan did as he was instructed and withdrew $200. He also handed over his ring, watch, and a gold chain. John got behind the wheel, and as he drove, reassured Juan and Sonia that they would not be harmed because they had cooperated. Three miles down the road, John stopped the car, pulled over, and true to his word, let Juan and Sonia out. The couple walked to a nearby store and called police. Meanwhile, John drove their car to a shopping center didn't bother to wipe away their fingerprints and just walked away. Four days later, John and Vincent were back at the same bank. It was 9.30 p.m. and the sky was getting dark. From the gas station across the street, they watched Willie Sams drive up to the ATM. They approached Willie's car and let themselves in. John pointed a gun at Willie and ordered him to withdraw $200. With the cash in his hands, he instructed Willie to drive to another bank and withdraw another 600 Then John got behind the wheel and drove them to a school. There, John and Vincent ordered Willie out of the car and forced him into a dumpster. Willie begged for his life, but that didn't stop John and Vincent. Without a second thought, the two men fired seven shots into the dumpster. The bullets pierced the dumpster and hit Willie multiple times. A single bullet pierced his heart. Willie died at 40. They removed the radio from Willie's car and attempted to wipe their fingerprints before abandoning it in a shopping mall parking lot. 
The next day, John and Vincent tried to use Willie's bank card at a clothing store to make a $700 purchase. But when the card got declined, they panicked and fled. Two days later, police located Willie's car. John hadn't done a very good job erasing their fingerprints, and police were able to match his prints to those found on the car and papers left inside. During Willie's autopsy, three bullets were removed from his body. A criminalist compared the bullets to ones that had been fired earlier by the guns stolen from Eileen's father. They were a match. Three days later, on August 24th, it was just before noon when Niels Nesbitt drove his wife, Elizabeth, to the Puente Hills Mall. Elizabeth was wearing a ring with 17 diamonds and two gold bracelets. She stayed in the car while Neil ran inside on a quick errand. Robert Machuca, a friend of John's, was with him at the mall with the intent to rob a store. But when they spotted all that gold sparkling on Elizabeth's hand, they changed their minds. They came prepared with a roll of duct tape and wrapped her hands and feet. Then John got behind the wheel and drove to a bank. He physically beat and coerced Elizabeth into providing her PIN number and managed to withdraw $400. He then drove to a convenience store and withdrew another 100 Then he headed out on the freeway while Robin followed. John pulled over and ordered her into the back and told her to lay down on the floor. He knew Elizabeth could identify him. He threw a blanket over her, then shot Elizabeth multiple times. She died at 49. John removed her jewelry and escaped with Robin. When Neil came out of the mall, his car and Elizabeth were gone. Just after 3 p.m., the California Highway Patrol located the car and Elizabeth. Inside, they retrieved three bullets and fingerprints, which came back a match to John. Three days later, the tour went back to the Puente Hills Mall. John, Robin, and Eileen were on the hunt for the next victim. Just after noon, they spotted Shirley Dunajean, park her Mercedes, and walk into the mall. They sat and waited. About 20 minutes later, Shirley returned, and just as she opened the driver's door, John forced his way into her car at gunpoint. He tied her hands together with plastic zip ties, then drove to a bank and used her car to withdraw $400. He drove to a second bank and withdrew 100 Then he drove to an ATM and tried another withdrawal, but was unsuccessful. He drove to another ATM. Again, no luck. Angry and frustrated, John drove down the freeway. Eileen and Vincent followed. Between two exits, John pulled over to the side of the freeway. At gunpoint, he forced Shirley to walk down on an embankment and into the bushes. At close range, he fired three shots. Shirley died at 56. At midnight, John made another attempt to withdraw money at an ATM and withdrew $220. That same day, police found Shirley's car. Fingerprints in the car and Dawn papers matched John and Robin. And the bullets removed from Shirley matched one of the handguns stolen from Eileen's father. Meanwhile, security at the Puente Hills Mall was increased. Customers and staff were nervous. Sheriff's detectives were now considering the possibility that the deaths of Willie, Elizabeth, and Shirley could be linked. They reviewed ATM surveillance photos, and two of the investigators recognized John and Robin from an early incident. 
Then, in a coincidence, police were able to link the foursome when John, Eileen, Robin, and Vincent were in a vehicle stopped by police who were investigating an unrelated crime. Police did not detain them. Rather, they tracked them to an apartment complex. And on August 30th, police arrested Eileen. Forty-five minutes later, they had John and Robin in handcuffs. Robin was arrested wearing Elizabeth's gold jewelry. In the apartment, police found the stolen handgun and bullets, both covered in John's fingerprints. Under a bed, they found a fully loaded stolen handgun. Also in the apartment, they found the five stolen rifles and ammunition. They also located plastic zip ties like the ones used on Shirley. And in a nightstand in the bedroom, they discovered a roll of duct tape that forensically matched the tape used on Elizabeth. They also found items belonging to several of the victims, including Shirley's purse, credit card, and wedding rings, and the radio from Willie's car. In November 1992, John, Eileen, Robin, and Vincent were tried together. During their six-week trial, more than 100 witnesses were called to testify for the prosecution, and 260 pieces of evidence were presented. The Los Angeles Times reported that the prosecution urged the jury to view the defendants as a crime family, in which each may not have used the murder weapon, but all played roles necessary for the crimes to occur. After four days of jury deliberations, ten armed bailiffs with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department formed a circle around the four defendants while their verdicts were read. Out of the 100 criminal charges they faced, they were found guilty of 78. Eileen, Robin, and Vincent were sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. John was sentenced to death. His automatic appeal was granted on several counts, but the death penalty remained. John sits on death row at the San Quentin Correctional Facility in California. Twenty years after her murder, Shirley's husband Ray told the press, If they carry out the execution for Lewis, I will feel good about it and have some closure on it and that he is not interested in revenge. Rather, he said, I want justice. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Philip Adro. On a small island in the Atlantic, the locals make their living fishing lobster. But when a petty thief went too far, those he stole from took matters into their own hands, and their actions forever divided a community. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. We love what we do and are dying to continue. If you enjoy listening to Murder in 20 every week, We'd be eternally grateful for your support by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or Murderin20.com. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effect from Vaseline Studios and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.